All right, we are doing books eight through the end. I think we need to come pack these speeches together. We're gonna try to cram it all in today. If I need to make two videos out of this, I will. But what's gonna happen is we're gonna kind of do a summary of each book and then do our analysis and discussion on each one, mostly in order, but I do need to jump ahead a little bit for a couple of these points. What book are we reading? <laughs> so if you are just now jumping in and missed our previous videos, hi, I'm Una. And I'm Crypto. We've got a whole playlist down below, including a before you read and as well as the other books if you've just started to join us. And if not, let's get into this. Book eight, Dimitri runs around panicking, offering terrible deals to Lyagavi, Madame Kokloff, and Dimitri ends up back at Fyodor's and finally we get the murder. Murder. Grigory yells parasite upon spotting Dimitri and is bludgeoned by Dimitri before he takes off. Now, Dimitri washes his clans clean, kind of like Lady Macbeth, and heads out to spend lavish amounts of money before leaving for Mokroye. I don't know how to pronounce that word. Is that how you say it, Mokroye? Yeah, you're, you're as good yeah. as mine. You know, my yeah. Russian is, yeah. Bear, bear, <laughs> bear with us to chase down Grushenka. Now there, Dimitri finds Grushenka with her Polish suitor and another countryman, and they engage in many Polish expressions before Dimitri pulls them aside to try to buy Grushenka from them. Instead, the two Polish individuals reveal Dimitri's attempt to buy her, and the tavern owner then reveals the Polish individuals were cheating at cards and kind of chases them off. Let's talk about this chapter. First thing I want to talk about is sensualness in terms of the language and how things are going. To begin with, I appreciate, I feel like, what Dimitri's going through. Okay. The zaniness, I think it's very entertaining, even though she only loved him for an hour and then mistreated him. And you're kind of sitting here thinking like, Dimitri, what are you doing? <laughs> Sounds like my very first date in high school. <laughs> well, and he'll sell anything for the money right now. And I think this is kind of coming down to, few, you know, one of the things Dostoevsky may be getting at is what will a man do for money when he's in need, right? Like this, this concept of Dimitri isn't lower class right? The way that some lower class people will. And I think that's easy to kind of depict what a lower class person may or may not do for money. It's subject of many stories, right? But Dimitri instead, what he really wants is Grushenka, but he doesn't have the immediate liquidatable money and he's willing to to sell his land for far cheaper than what it's actually worth. And, and you have Kokolov like doing this pyramid schema, mining scheme to try to get him to make money. <laughs> But he's willing to almost like make any type of like Faustian deal to get what he wants, which is this woman who only loved him for an hour and it's kind of cruel to him. I think that this is a good literary technique that Dostoevsky is kind of implementing here late in the story uh, to try to push you towards figuring out who the murderer is. And I think that, you know, kind of misrepresenting Dimitri here a little bit, uh, you know, through the zaniness and the money aspect, because he really isn't that bad of a guy, right? I mean, he is, but he isn't. I think it's kind of embellished a little bit here in this late game of the story. Well, and it's it's supplemented with the words like we have these poetry like statements, like a red hot coal in his heart. And I want to dance. Let everyone see how I dance. As you know, Grushenka has this temptation and, and Maximoff kind of talks about how she dances with legs so slim and sides so trim. We have a very sensual experience in these chapters, right? People doing what gives them pleasure. Even Grushenka has those talks about let's party tonight and we'll ask for forgiveness. You know, God will forgive us is kind of the idea behind Grushenka in some of these temptations. And even though this video, like we're starting on book eight and our previous video was book seven, I feel like this is kind of like a foil of book seven where seven has these thou language and very uh, scripture based in terms of how it words things as opposed to this, which is very hedonist, very sensual based in terms of like, let's just do what gives us pleasure. Let's dance. Let's, let's bang. Let's, let's do whatever we can to have a good time. And I feel like the two are kind of being played against each other for the purpose of in a Dostoevsky novel, if you're a character who's very sensual, you're going to be punished by your actions. Yeah, definitely. So they're making Dimitri feel guilty. They're making him feel desperate. You know, they're making him impassionate and just like it's all about money and it's not about Groshenka at all. Uh, and I think that this is, you know, painting this imperfect picture of him kind of throw you off the scent and i think it's beautifully done here and it's at the perfect time too because you've gone through five six and seven which are some pretty dense beefy you know literature to read and then here on eight it's a little bit off-putting but it does that you know throwing you off balance on purpose 
And I think it it ties in with some of the Zosima spirituality too, right? Because here's where Dimitri kind of starts to recognize at least some humility after all this this punishment. We have the quote, in his mood of dog-like submissiveness, all feelings of rivalry had died away. And I think we talked about earlier about how Dostoevsky very, being very, you know, orthodox based believes in that submission to to God, right? He this is part of his attack on I think the palpable claims with the grand inquisitor. And then that is even tied together too, I think you could look at it from Grushenka's perspective, right? Because she's upset that she's being bought even though she was a prostitute, right? Like like that's the first kind of like funny thing that you would kind of have to chuckle at a little bit. But then I think you have to realize too that this also ties back to the grand inquisitor too with why does it matter that she can sell her body and it's okay, but Dmitri can't buy her body. That's not okay. The difference is choice, right? Grushenka made the choice to make that sell in the original part in the same way Dimitri's choosing to sell his land at a cr- crazy, ridiculous price. But when Dimitri tries to take over and, and speak for her body, that's when she gets upset. It's, it's when her free will was taken away, which is one of Dostoevsky's big criticisms of Russia at this time, using the Bible as the, the structure for how to deliver that. Yeah, so I think what he's done here with Dimitri is putting that sin forward and kind of flipping it on its head here and making this idea of humanity, what does it mean to be human and these characteristics of these individuals. And then he goes through kind of this spiritual adventure as we get into, you know, book nine, and you realize that it, it has all been, you know, kind of like a red herring, right, for for Dimitri's character. Well, it's all part of the suffering, I think, for Dimitri's character to have finally recognized, right? Because because of the harm that this whole drama situation between uh, between father and son, right, both one and Grushenka, it has caused so much harm to everyone around them in terms of the other brothers, Grushenka, Grushenka's other suitors, uh, this tavern that they're they're going crazy in and having these parties and stuff. I think Dostoevsky is trying to show that our choices do impact other people. We do have a role in society and can't just you know do what's do what's right and what's pleasurable for us because I think that comes with consequences. Is what Dmitri is seeing specifically. So his idea of Dimitri then is his sinfulness versus his goodness and that he has his father partially to blame, himself to blame, and then they're also saying, well, is it an outside influence of Groshenka as well? It's very, very complex, and that's why I think it's you know magnificently done and placed perfectly in this position of the book. Well, it's interesting that you say father, too, because his biological father is Fyodor, right? But then yeah. we also have to talk about his probably more connected and actual spiritual father i don't even know if it's spiritual involved father right with with grigory where even grigory puts the worst intentions on dimitri if you remember dimitri went to the house and he was going to leave quote unquote kind of peacefully right he wasn't planning on actually murdering his father but when grigory saw him he yells parasite and that's when you know during the struggle dimitri bludgeons him with the pistol and I think it's kind of ironic that he yells parasite because he was basically Dimitri's father, the guy that kind of raised him. And he's the one that got struck when he put the worst intentions on Dimitri, when Dimitri at that point had already decided he was going to leave and not cause harm at that point in time. And I think it's part of Dostoevsky's idea of we all don't live in our own little box. We live in a society and our choices and assumptions of others can lead to harm, such as in this situation. So I think that brings it back to what you said of this idea of Dimitri's free will. And I don't know, can we spoil it, you know, of Dimitri's guilt or not guilt? Well, we have a quote from Dimitri where he says, I accept the torture of accusation and my public shame. I want to suffer and by suffering, I shall be purified. So at this point, okay, so Fyodor's murder hasn't actually happened yet, but he's accepting kind of some of the the suffering for it. We're expecting you to have read the rest of the book at this point in time, so we're going to bring up all of the books in this discussion. So as Crypto's alluding to, we find out that Dimitri's guilt, while real, isn't necessarily how we would traditionally have viewed it because he didn't do the first-hand actions that we'll see kind of also later on with Avant. Neither one of them actually killed Fyodor, but they are experiencing the guilt and ramifications of it. Yeah, so the interpretation of his guilt or evilness here 
is kind of on display for all to see as we end book eight, right? Dostoevsky loves violent and fatal deaths for a lot of his main characters, right? We saw it in Crime and Punishment. We saw it in The Beggar Boy at Christ's Christmas Tree. And I can't help but wonder if part of this is kind of like that Pascal's wager where we're being asked to judge Fyodor. I wouldn't be surprised if you ask people, if you, if, you know, with, with all the horrible things that we see Fyodor do, <laughs> there's people out right. there that, that wanted him to die, right? And at the same time, they feel sad when Zosima dies or when Grigory, the innocent, the martyr, the one being hit here, the one that raised Dmitri, they feel sad when they die. And I think this is all part of Dostoevsky's point of what makes it okay for us to judge Fyodor guilty and not feel bad about his murder and death, but we feel for Zosima and Grigory, who are these saints that take on suffering of others. It's almost a little bit of um, that quote we had from one of the earlier chapters of, you can love humanity from afar, but when you get up close, that's when you see some of the cracks or you know some of the, the, the flaws in your fellow man. And what Dostoevsky is doing is showing us the flaws of this man and showing us the perfectness of Zosima or the, the sacrifice of Grigory. But we can have completely different feelings and even have wanted maybe Fyodor to die for some of his you know, crimes. And I think that's a question that we have to be asking of, is, wow, are we eventually stepping towards that point where we're choosing who lives and dies? Are we happy and celebrating when some people are dead, when we say we love humanity from afar? But when we get up close, we realize that might not be true. That whole quote and point earlier about when we start to see how some people maybe maybe aren't the best people, suddenly we can wish ill upon them or not go the extra step to love them is probably one of the points that Dostoevsky is making to us at this point in time. I want, I want to jump on the point that you said that, that we all have different views because I think that if I read this a second or third time through, again, my first time through, and I think I did feel like how you pointed out just now, but I think that if I could read it a second time in a few years or if I'd read it when I was younger and now I read it this time as my second or third read through, I believe that maybe I wouldn't feel that way and that I would feel like, wow, maybe Fyodor doesn't deserve to die and these other people do because it, it is a matter of perspective. I think that's what Dostoevsky is trying to point out is that what you will read as who is deserving and who is not is going to say something about you. It's kind of like the view of, you know, people have argued on, uh, you know, Karate Kid that Daniel's the bad guy, maybe. Mm. Or the Empire did nothing wrong in Star Wars, right? The, the Empire did nothing wrong. You know, they're just trying to take care of the universe. And it's those, you know, pesky rebels. Uh, so it, it is really a matter of perspective here of, you know, yeah, Fyodor might not be a great person, but does that mean he deserves to die? I don't know. That That's a tough philosophical question if someone deserves to live or die. All right, book nine, back home, Pyotr Ilyich begins gathering evidence against Dmitri. Meanwhile, Marfia hears Smerdyakov screaming with epileptic fits and finds Grigory injured and then finds Fyodor murdered. The medical examiner soon arrives and finds it strange for Smerdyakov's condition to have lasted for two days. The police have found Fyodor's head was bludgeoned and the pistol discarded. They find the envelope with money for Grushenka from Fyodor, and the envelope had been torn open and money stolen. Dmitri learns that Grigory, however, is still alive, and he claims to be a martyr to honor. Dmitri tells the prosecutors he's not guilty of his father, but instead Grigory. He also tells the prosecutors about the night of the murder. Dmitri finally reveals that he had the money stolen from Katrina for quite some time, and we experience a bunch of testimonies from many different people, and the investigation continues to focus on 3K for some specific reason. <laughs> so <Right. laughs> this, this is jumping in and following up perfectly with that subjective version of truth, right? When we're subjected to all of these different testimonies, and each one's just like a little bit different or offers a different reason or justification for the actions, I think this is playing to some of the things that we were just talking about in terms of how we judge whether one character should live or die, and do we do these sorts of things in real life? Do we give preferential treatment to some versus the other? Do we say we love everybody, but we really don't treat them equally? Maybe not equating those those things exactly, because I think love you can love someone and maybe not treat them equally. But I think that is one of the challenges that we're being pushed to kind of question of 
what are we not being unfair at and what are we not being unfair at and aware of or not aware of? And Dimitri here commits like all of these sins, right? He lies, he steals, he cheats, he eventually does murder. And he, you know, it is this passionate person. And then, you know, you feel like you, you feel for him because you think maybe he is doing this, you know, out of that goodness. And it, it's very, very complicated as you list off all of these sins that he has, you know, done over the course of the book up to this point in time. And this all kind of leads to an interesting point with the curtains. Did you notice how many times like Dostoevsky puts someone behind the curtains? If you remember much earlier, lo- we, yeah. we had, we had Grushenka. <laughs> well, we had yeah, that. We, in this book alone, well, if you remember, we had Grushenka hiding behind the curtains with Katrina and Alyosha, right? We have okay, Grushenka so was hiding behind one when she was upset and crying, right? And didn't want to reveal probably how she was hurt with uh, the, the Polish individuals in Dimitri's fight. And then here, the prosecutors, if you remember, send Dimitri to be stripped naked so that they can kind of, you know, search. And again, he goes behind the curtain. We have three usages of curtain. And all of them, um, I think, are kind of meant to reveal the truth. We're, we're trying to get past this subjective, experiential version of truth that we have with all of these testimonies and all of these different ways we can judge people guilty or not. And it's only once, you know, you come out from behind that curtain, when you come out from that veil that people put on of deception, do we get a real potential objective truth, a, a truth of some sort? And I think the curtain is meant to kind of represent crossing that that border of accepting the truth. Or he's just sitting there banging away at his typewriter and he loves these beautiful curtains that he has in his house. <laughs> <laughs> no, yours is probably more correct, but he seems to definitely have a fascination with curtains. So he, he must be an interior designer. <laughs> Dostoevsky. <laughs> Let's move into class and serfdom a little bit. We've talked about master-servant a little bit, which can be taken both from a biblical standpoint of where we're supposed to yield to the God creator, and also from a serfdom perspective of where you have landowners and serfs who are supposed to submit to their landowners. Which way does Dostoevsky mean it? I honestly think he means it a little bit of both ways, I think, with this book sometimes, depending on the chapter. Yeah, he definitely going to bounce around. It, it feels like the book is so sometimes historical and then psychological, sociological. I don't know where he's going this economics at sometimes, but definitely the history, as we've talked about numerous times before of Russia in the 19th century is going to play a huge role on how he's writing this dynamic family and why there are the implications of this cultural divide that is begun in Russia at the time. And to hone in we need to talk about Fenya because it was kind of very flippant the way that you you forget like a lot of the the lower class individuals are specifically meant to be a little forgettable in a Dostoevsky novels it's it's we're putting honor precedence priority on people with money like Katrina right they're red shirts (laughs) but you have these characters like Fenya who's a servant right the probably ex-serf at this point in time and and Dimitri just drops that he he's gonna strangle her, but you know he didn't really have time. He had <laughs> he had to go off and do something else. Which, I know we should laugh at that, but it's like those little things that are like, is this supposed to be humorous or not? Because that's kind of crazy. Well, it's kind of a very flippant thing to just drop off and imagine. Like, imagine you're actually talking with a police officer. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah the, the servant. Yeah, you didn't have time to do that. <laughs> and it's and, I, and the and the police officer is just like, yeah, I get it. It's okay mm-hmm, because no, yeah, that's totally. 19th century Russia. I can't tell you how many times I would have wanted to have hit my my servant, right? But to your <laughs> point, but to your point, uh, I, this is hypersensualized, and I think it's okay to laugh at because it's fiction, right? This isn't real life. This is this true. is meant to this is meant to make fun of those situations and talk about yeah, it's really dumb how he's just so flippant and can just throw away a servant's life. But if it was Katrina, well, crap call the police. We're, we're investigating this. Nobody gets away with murdering upper class. It's just one of the many examples of, of the lower class being invisible in this novel. And I like the way that Dostoevsky does that. I think one of my favorite parts is coming up with that too, actually. And I think he's done that. A point is he said so many times in his books is that he is indirectly, that he is the voice for those that don't have a voice and that he's speaking for this new class of serfs that are no longer serfs that maybe can't read and write and they have no way to get their feelings out into the world. And he's including them as these little subtle, you know, nuances in this book to say, hey, these are people too, and they do have lives that matter, even though that this class system is finally coming to an end in Russia at this time. 
All right, let's transition into book 10, the book that a lot of people kind of maybe aren't really sure what the, its place is, but it's actually quite imperative in my opinion. But Kolya is the young boy to whom Ilyusha had stabbed in the thigh with a penknife. The recent widowed Anna Fedorovna Krasotskin raised him as a single mother, and one day Kolya tried to lay down under a train that scared him straight and tried to impress other boys. Now, Kolya had become the neighbor's children's guardian and guardian of their house with... Parazon, his dog, Kolya met with oh gosh, these names. Kolya met with Smirov. And they, can you give me a little bit of credit? You're gonna be fluent. These, give me a little you're bit of credit. You're gonna be fluent Russian names. by the time you're Good done, Lord. man. You're doing great. Keep going. All right, and they talk about <laughs> Ilyusha having consumption and how doctors are quacks, according to Kolya. They walk around the market, and Kolya calls people by the wrong name in a who's on first moment and makes fun of them with their beards. Kolya remarks, "I like to stir up fools in every class of society." Now, Kolya tells Smirov to go fetch Alexei, and Kolya tells Alyosha, when he arrives, about Ilyusha's backstory. Kolya had told Alyosha how he had taken Ilyusha, I know these names, I apologize, guys, <laughs> had taken Ilyusha under his wing to kind of show the class runt of the ropes, if you will, but started to act colder when Ilyusha had become too attached to him. Ilyusha became angry at this, and he had learned to hide a pin in soft bread and feed it to stray dogs from Smerdyakov. What a good guy, that Smerdyakov, I tell you. Oof. Yeah. Probably one of the more brutal mm. scenes, particularly for pet lovers who are reading this. Now, when he does go to their local stray, Zuchka, Kolya cuts off their friendship when Zuchka is hurt by eating the pins. That's why Ilyusha snapped and stabbed Kolya in the leg callback to the earlier chapters where people are like why am i getting this backstory i I feel you it's probably a little confusing at first now alyosha finally paying off alyosha gets all the boys to reconcile with ilyusha except kolya ilyusha instead is given this little puppy in hopes of cheering him up and when kolya brings in the dog and reveals that it's actually zuchka all along and not peroshin uh it lifts his spirits right so later kolya and alyosha go out together and uh, kolya admits that he's in (laughs) atheistic socialist total normal conversation to have with a monk right due to <laughs> due to the talks with rakitin oh that rakitin always pulling strings behind the scenes here alyosha and kolya go back and forth about his convictions and his beliefs and whether he is too young to actually believe these things but when alyosha says one day he'll understand how age impacts one's convictions and he's probably repeating someone else's words i don't know <laughs> the conversation the conversation kind of and strangely, I guess. The doctor recommends to take Ilyusha to Italy to get better. But of course, Snigirov, or Captain Snigirov, doesn't really have the money for that, right? Doctors are like, yeah, just go, just go take him on a, a, a trip to Italy. It'll be no big deal, even though he's living in all this poverty. Another class commentary there. So I guess the biggest thing we need to talk about is does this book fit, right? I think that's the biggest criticism that a lot of people have with this. And what I think is nice about this book is that it's kind of like the entire Brothers K just smashed into one chapter. It's it's this almost frame narrative reinforcing a lot of the points of the rest of the book is, is what I would say. Because you have like Anna who tries to take on her son Kolya's suffering, right? Which is maybe a lot like the brothers and uh, who have lost their parents and have these complexes. Kolya's not submitting to a higher authority. But you have, you know, all the brothers who are taking on maybe some of the sins. And, and <laughs> we all know Fyodor was trying to do that as the Holy Fool earlier. We have Ilyusha dying, which is not unlike Zosima, who is dying and being surrounded by all of his friends. And the same way that Ilyusha is surrounded by all of his classmates when he's passing away. We have a young boy suffering, just like in Ivan's speech earlier. We have Ilyusha is probably not innocent with feeding pins to dogs and stabbing his friends. And we have the feeding and remorse from Smerdyakov with the cats and Grigory earlier in the story. And we have socialism talk with religion with Alyosha and Kolya and uh, the Zosima teachings about how active love is what heals people. And here's Alyosha bringing all these kids and Kolya together to can reconcile and stuff. So we see a lot of mirroring of people's actions in the rest of this novel with this chapter specifically. And I think it's meant to kind of reinforce it or kind of say, this is a, this is a repeatable solution and problem that society has and faces, not just in these characters, but in all of people's lives is one of the ways that I could take this chapter. Yeah. I love how you worded that there. I think that it definitely reinforces this standard that's set through the whole story for all of the sons and all the young boys. And I think that it really does kind of wrap everything up and it sets this tone 
tone that it can be passed down from generation to generation. I think that what Dostoevsky is trying to say here is that whatever life you live, there's going to be a legacy for that, and that's going to be passed down to your children. They're going to take influence from that. And then what happens next is, you know, what ultimately culminates in their own legacy that you have kind of started them on this path. The last thing I want to bring up here is this book 10, chapter 6, was really important to me as a young reader the first time I read this in my earlier 20s. We have the quote, I am at a complete loss to understand what my age has to do with it. The question is, what are my convictions? Not what is my age, isn't it? When you are older, you'll understand for yourself the influence of age on convictions. I am fancied too, that you were not expressing your own ideas, Alyusha answered serenely and modestly. But Kolya interrupted him hotly. Come, you want obedience and mysticism. You must admit that the Christian religion, for instance, has only been of use to the rich and the powerful to keep the lower classes in slavery. That's so, isn't it? Ah, I know where you read that, and I'm sure someone told you so, cried Alyosha. And this was important to me because I feel like many people may come to this novel following like maybe an idol or a friend that has recommended this book, or maybe they Googled what are the top 100 books to read before you die. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not criticizing those actions. But what, what made me kind of question myself when I first read this is this concept of, am I just repeating someone else's words? Are these really my own convictions? Or am I just trying to sound smart or trying to win a specific argument? You see this all the time where people memorize specific responses to arguments and trying to repeat, uh, you know, the, the it's kind of like a chess match, right? You memorize all the moves, improving upon the previous generations, trying to get to that ultimate solution of chess. And uh, I think it's kind of one of those things with this too, where you have to say, when am I kind of repeating what are the steps to success or the, the convictions of others versus when am I being true to myself? And I think that was very important to me when it, particularly I thought I was picking this book because I'm like, oh, I got to read this book because it says that's the book I have to read before I die. This, this will make me look smart. I don't, I don't know why I read it specifically, <laughs> but I think it challenged me to think, why am I doing these things? Like, what does it mean to do something that other people think may make you look intellectual, right? Is this really me? Is this really something I enjoy? And it is, <laughs> luckily. But I think it made me question my own actions of why am I choosing this path? And is this really my words or my thoughts? Or am I just roboting someone else's thoughts? Oh, that, that word right there, action, is so good. Because I think what Dostoevsky has done in this book is that he's created real human interactions and when you read this, you're going to see yourself in those actions as we talked about. But I think that what you're kind of alluding to here maybe is, and again, if I'm wrong, tell me, but it's that idea of knowledge versus wisdom. And knowledge you can gain and you can spew back out and maybe sound smart, but wisdom is truly understanding something. And I think Dostoevsky here in this book is trying to get you to think beyond just what you've learned thus far in the book and trying to really ground out some of that wisdom of these interconnected relationships between these people that go beyond just what is on the surface. Right. And, and I think that's maybe some of his criticisms of Yvonne's argument of uh, the suffering of children, right? Because in the same way that Zosima said that you had to have active love, we use that word over and over again in this discussion, you see Alyosha practicing that as well, of bringing these children together, of we can't stop everybody suffering, but we can do the best to make someone feel loved and wanted and do, do our best to ease people's pains in the life in truly understanding them as opposed to just intellectualizing their existence and trying to ease. It's truly empathizing with them. Yeah, and I want to bring up real quick here, I think that he kind of brings up science a little bit here, and he just throws this little nugget at you to try to start this, you know, almost argument between science versus faith, right, with this idea of the seizures. Yeah, where the scientists didn't, scientists, the doctors didn't really know why he was having it for two <laughs> days, as that's not normal. Um, and even just the doctors are very callous in this. He paints them of, you know, we'll just send your kid to Italy for a trip. You know, you poor Captain Sniggear off and, and how, uh, you know, they, they were just looking for money a lot of the times as opposed to faith providing comfort. Very different times, 19th century Russia as opposed to now and <laughs> with, with the state that you and I live in. But he is very clearly taking, I think, shots at, at science, but glorifying what faith can do in these situations. Yeah, the Hippocratic Oath at this time period was probably something a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, let's get into the what I think is kind of my climax for the movie, which is really, this was a special chapter. Book 11. Dimitri's trial approaches, and Grishinka is particularly worried about the trial she thinks Merdyakov is guilty. Now, Katerina Ivanovna dun, dun, dun. puts up about 3,000 rubles. You know, she's just throwing money left and right. Look at this, look at this upper-class woman solving problems with her money. She uh, brings in Fetyukov, Fetyukovich to de- represent Dmitri, and Alexei speaks with Madame Kokolov, who tells him that she trusts Alexei with Lisa, but not Ivan, who visited her, and now she's just a little off, right? <laughs> Lisa starts to become a little hateful. <laughs> A little mistrustful, <laughs> a little more reclusive little. from society. Just a smidge. Just, just a smidge, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we have uh, Alyosha kind of ask, why do evil? And she says, so that everything might be destroyed. Okay, nihilism, we got Whoa. it. You know, we get it, yeah. Dostoevsky. We, we know that you're fucking That's not nihilism. subtle. <laughs> yeah, that's not subtle at all. Now, Alyosha says that some people hear evil at times. And he had the same evil dream. And I think this speaks to, you know, there's evil in all of us. Now, Rakitin visits Dimitri, and Dimitri says Rakitin has convinced him there is no God, and science is the answer. Wow. Nihilism, left and right, right? <laughs> Alyosha yeah, he ain't st- pulling any punches in this chapter, that's for sure. Alyosha stops by Katerina's and spots Yvonne leaving her house, and Yvonne says he's got to go keep uh, Katerina from handing over a document that would convict Fyodor, and he also shows little remorse for her state. Ivan suddenly has a feeling to go to Smerdyakov's, and Ivan approaches him several times to speed this up. And uh, we kind of have that quote, forgive me, I thought you were like me from Smerdyakov. When Smerdyakov admits to killing Fyodor and thought Ivan had condoned it per their conversation at the gates. Smerdyakov, Spoilers! Smerdyakov pulls 3K <laughs> uh, from the murder, gives it to Ivan, and he's still shocked that Ivan had no idea that he, that he was giving him permission to perform this murder because everything is lawful when you're your own moral arbiter, right? Yeah. Yep. Well, we have Ivan go through his his dream here, which I thought was very impactful and very important, I think, to speak to some of the moralistic and socialistic concepts at the time in Russia. And eventually, Alyosha arrives to Ivan's and wakes him up, telling him that Smerdyakov has hung himself. I think this is where I start to feel, like, doubt, and I, I start pitying him, and then I get angry for him kind of taking his own life and like there's contempt. I feel like this chapter is so impactful because of all the emotions that start stirring up inside of a person as they read it. And as you've gone through this entire journey, you were kind of wanting salvation for some of the characters, right? As to your point earlier, you felt like, you know, this person should be punished and this person should have their happily ever after. And uh, if we've learned nothing in Dostoevsky, it's not going to play out that way. It's going to play out how it does in real life. There is no fairy tale happy book ending for really anybody per se. Well, first of all, let's talk about this nightmare. Was this was this nightmare real for you or how did... You know, was this the devil? Was this Yvonne's projection? How did this nightmare land upon you? I think it was really self-identifying kind of the idea of knowledge and suffering. And he is questioning his own sanity. And I think that a lot of times that happens in our subconscious. And I think that sometimes Dostoevsky is going to throw that off on his, you know, religious stint of, you know, this is the devil, because at this time period, a lot of people are going to believe that interpretation of the divine or in this case, the opposite of divine intervention of, oh, it's okay to justify these feelings because, quote, the devil made me do it. Well, Ivan has a lot of stress in his life, right? He just lost his father. We find out that his half brother, in a sense, is the one that murdered him, and that he condoned it is is what is what the stresses are that's going part of partly going through his mind, right? Yeah, well, I mean, he's a little bit self pitying, though, isn't he? I, I would a, a say smidge. this: he, he, <laughs> he he has a big problem in the same way that Raskolnikov has his problem in in Crime and Punishment with his own ideologies and whether he lives up to them, right? Here comes intellectual Ivan with that same struggle of, I don't want to believe that God is real. Right. But if this if this person before me or if this action of the suffering of children is real, if this truly is the devil, then that means evil is real. And the argument is that if if true evil is real, then there must be true good, which means that God must exist. And that's what Yvonne is starting to struggle with and why not only does he not want to believe in God, he can't believe in the devil, because if the devil is real, 
some people would argue that true evil proves that true good must exist as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a deep thought, and that's hard for some to overcome, right? If there's light, there has to be darkness. If there's darkness, there has to be light. I don't know. That that That's a tough one, and that's where I think that I identify a lot with Yvonne uh, in, in this case of the story. If I'm really starting to hit home and thinking, oh, okay, I get this guy. I get this guy. Yeah, because can you truly be brave if there isn't all if there isn't some form of cowardice right like if, if you aren't ever afraid how can you truly be brave is is the argument the counter you know the the, the comparison i think for good versus evil and what's interesting yeah. here with avon is you'll notice that at one point he said that the, this gentleman even kind of looked a little bit like theodore i believe with like you know if you remember theodore was very proud of his own appearance with his hooked nose and stuff like that we get a little bit of that here with this man and i think this kind of speaks to the sins of our fathers too where he's seeing his father in himself the the evil the evil deeds or mistreatment that his father has done he's seeing a little bit of that in, in himself and did he really condone this murder because of that yeah yeah i think that uh you know a lot of us are going to see our own faults in our parents because it allows us to justify them. Dostoevsky loves to compare two people, right? So you have both Ivan and Smerdyakov in this situation who tend to be people who look out for themselves. The difference being Smerdyakov can do it where he's amoral and can harm others. But Ivan, what we're experiencing is he feels guilt if he harms others, right? That's the whole difference where Smerdyakov doesn't feel guilt from what happened to, to Fyodor, but Ivan is just mentally broken because he realizes if he really is doing true evil in this world, he's what he all along his intellectual standards were trying to justify that there wasn't. And all of a sudden those walls are breaking down when he starts to accept that he is accepting the guilt and the sins of his father and the sins of Smerdyakov. Yeah, agreed. And I think it goes back to a lot of the mental state, as you said before, of how is he interpreting this dream, uh, Yvonne and Smerdyakov, of, you know, are they in a right mind to make those calls about themselves? Because we're kind of looking at this inner monologue through this uh, as someone looking out from the outside in. I think the view would be very, very different. And the dream ends up with like that that man using science to advance himself to your earlier point about him kind of attacking science a little bit in this book. If man keeps advancing science and keeps advancing his knowledge to uh, eventually be greater and greater, he eventually becomes this man god. I think they described it as like this perfect man, if you will. But the problem is this, every man god has his own standards. Once again, we've become our own gods, right? We have no... We have no objective form of truth or morality. We only have subjective truth and morality. And when once that happens, everything goes. So we've once again come first full circle back to Yvonne's argument of subjective morals are extremely harmful, and he's afraid that that's where it's going. Yeah, I think that comes back to the kind of one of the whole points in the maybe book is measuring evil or are you measuring good? And does it matter which one you're measuring? Because they're going to be the complete opposites. If you have 60 of one, you have 40 of the other. Well, and I think also we're also seeing how we're all corruptible. I don't know if there's one character in this book that we haven't seen cause some type of a fall in himself, whether it even be through Zosimo's flashback when we saw he wasn't the best person. It's not that he couldn't become better, you know, walk a better path. But every single person has some evil in them is also probably one of the arguments that we can see here. Because one of the things that we've talked about in the past in other videos is a dream, you're not actually having a conversation with another person. If, this, if we believe this is a dream and this isn't one of those uh, mystic experiences, right? But if this truly is a dream, okay, and not a mystic revelatory experience where he's meeting the devil, the fallen angel, I believe he's quoted as, then you're having a conversation with yourself. Right? Yeah. Because you're not yep. talking to your wife, you're not talking to your lover, you're not talking to your brother in a dream, you're talking to yourself, you're talking to a projection of that person, and anything you create or interact with is your own creation. And that's when Yvonne realizes that he is able and possible to create evil in the same way that evil is in all of us. And I think he's recognizing here what is evil, because from certain perspectives, Smear Jackoff didn't didn't perform an evil act because he himself is trying to justify it to make things a little bit lighter in this chapter can we talk to also about when yvonne's <laughs> walking up the stairs right and he sees the peasant and he just kind of knocks him off into the snow 
<laughs> I couldn't stop it's laughing. Those, it's it's those subtle jabs. Just like, wait, you're doing that. You're doing that, Dostoevsky. All right, you're going there, man. It's just like well, you're so in. You're so embroiled in this really depth part of the story, and you're like, you're reading it, and you're trying to take notes, and you're thinking about it. And I'm trying to have these conversations in my head of what we're gonna talk about on here, and I'm like. What, he just did that? Come on, man. Like, you're pulling me out of this depth, and it works, though, because I think that you need that dose of comedy in there to kind of balance it out. As it always comes back to that scale through the whole book, he's balancing everything, even something as subtle as seriousness versus comedy. It's so painful, too, because not only is it funny, but there's a dang point to it, too, with, with this whole invisible class thing that we've talked about, how we can mistreat and take out our anger or our evil uh, on others. And Smerdyakov in this part, too, is even warning him that when it goes to court, the court's going to be the lower class, like the, ju- the jury is going to be lower class people who are going to associate probably not with Katerina or with the upper class individuals being tried, but more with the people who have gone through years of suffering in a sense, too. We are not perfect judges of each other's actions. Oh, my gosh, have we come all the way back? To the point of, did we want Fyodor to die, and did we regret when Zosima and, and Grigory were hurt, right? Zosima died and Grigory was injured. Um, we are imperfect judges in, in when it comes to how we look and, and have this subjective experience to reality. And even Smerdyakov, for all of the evil or amoral, maybe even, actions that he has, I guess that's another discussion. Is, is he amoral or is he evil, right? He's got both sides. But I think he recognizes the difference but just doesn't care. But... For all of his, whether you classify as amoral or evilness, he still gets people. He understands more than all the other characters that people associate with others that are like them and even calls out how in a, in a trial in this next chapter, uh, it's going to be a lower class ju- you know, group of jurors that are going to probably associate not with the upper class individuals in the story. Yeah, and he's smart enough to know that he's been able to manipulate this to his advantage through the whole story and would have got away with it had he not confessed because even, you know, with reading it through the first time, I was convinced that it was Dimitri. And I think that he it's written so well that most people are probably going to, you know, be able to... Uh, n- most people aren't going to be able to figure it out and kind of go down that path that Dostoevsky has led you. Right. And Smerdyakov even has these quotes like, for you've always thought no more of me than if I'd been a fly. And I think that's just such a beautiful way to kind of express how invisible the lower class individuals are to the society. Or the idea that, you know, they're just a nuisance, not necessarily just invisible, that, you know, you're always, shoo fly, go away, you don't matter to me, that you're you're annoying me, that you're, you're burdening me with this. And he's like, well, I'm going to show you what a fly can do. And that's exactly what Fyodor did to Grigory and Smerdyakov earlier on in like books three or four at the dinner. He's like, be gone, you two. Don't bore me with your stories anymore. Shoe fly is exactly what he did. And then it's kind of reiterated of why book 10 is so important as well is because you see those social interaction between the boys and how it defines their relationships and defines of how they want to behave as people. All right, book 12. Let's wrap this up. The trial begins. We got courtroom stuff where we discredit all the witnesses. <laughs> Courtroom stuff. Grigory was drunk, Rakitin <laughs> accepts bribes, Polish individuals cheated, and a doctor defense is a comedy between the doctors. And then Alyusha testifies next, right? And he recalls Dimitri pointing to a strange part of his breast when he was declaring his honor and backed up the wear that Dimitri, that's that's where he had, you know, the 1,500 you know, rubles kind of hidden all along. And uh, Katerina's called up, and again, the class discussion where she's kind of shown more respect because she is upper noble class compared to all the other characters. And Grishenka's kind of called out, and there's the big reveal with her Keaton being her cousin, which kind of puts some shade on his testimony and such. Vaughn comes to the stand, and he is absolutely crazy. <laughs> Claims the devil is real. Uh, he's caused murder. I, I don't mean to say that he's crazy. I mean to say that he's exaggerated to a point of hysterics where we can't trust his hyster- uh, uh, sit. Uh, Testimony, I should say. Next up, Katerina breaks down, hands over the letter that Dimitri had written, and shows that uh, Katerina loves Ivan over Dimitri. And uh, we have the famous Troika and Russia speech here, I think uh, very well quoted here, uh, that kind of talks about how Russia treats its people. And I think this is Dostoevsky's letter to all of Europe at this point in time. Worth checking out. And uh, Blackstone's principles kind of uh, explored here with the usage of the 10 guilty, then it's better to... Uh, release 10 guilty individuals, then punish one one uh, innocent, innocent individual. 
Right? Yeah. Right. So Dimitri is guilty <laughs> and lots of focus on the peasants being the deciders is, is the end of chapter 12. And uh, this whole scene just comes back to that point we made earlier about how, how we judge people, right? How we yep. want to associate people with people similar to us about how we want to discredit or, you know, not see certain things. This whole chapter, whole book leads to this trial moment where how we act as individuals is what is represented in the ending. And I think it comes back to like a conscience, right? If that if we're going to be judged no matter what we do, you're going to be judged by your family, you're going to be judged by yourself, and you're going to be judged by your peers. And it doesn't matter whether you're in a courtroom or whether you're in a classroom or whether you're in the grocery store. Uh, it, it's all going to come down to perception. And uh, that's pretty pressing, I think, on one psyche. And these characters are so complex. I think Dostoevsky has done a miraculous job being able to cram this all into one novel and kind of wrap it up nicely here in a bow at this, you know, I would say the same word that you've said before, kind of zany court trial, right? Can you imagine this as a, uh, a show on TV? You'd just be like, oh, my God, this is the worst, you know, court case ever on night court. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I just think this is a very nice love letter, I think, to the class problems in the era. Serfdom being abolished wasn't long before this novel was, was published. You know, they're obviously still struggling to figure out people's worth at this point in time. You have Herz Stuba, who was actually treating even the poor individuals as opposed to the rich. Was it Moscow doctor that was kind of like very flippant with people? And you had Katerina obviously being treated well here. But uh, I think this speaks to the social shift where the power used to be in the czars and the wealthy class, I guess, in a sense. And it still is, right, in a sense. Well, there's no czars, but we still have, um, no, we still have czars. That doesn't happen until 1921, right? Um, but we have a shift. No, yeah, there's still a czar. We have a shift that's happening where the lower class is coming to power, I should say. And I think this is saying there is danger in even just a subjective power shift like this in terms of who you side with is one of the things that you could take away from a lot of this courtroom drama. Yeah, I think that it, it's this dramatic conclusion to the idea of individuality, it is to philosophy, and these abstract constraints that we make these models of ourselves that happens throughout the course of book 12. Uh, and it, it's, it's very encouraging, I think, as a peoples to know that we can evolve and change. And I think that's what Dostoevsky is kind of challenging here, is that people can become something different. You don't have to be stuck in this rigid, you know, portrayal of what people think you are, what you think yourself is like the brothers are. Now, moving on to the epilogue, five days after Dimitri's trial, Alexei goes to see Katerina Ivanovna, and uh, Ivan is still sick and unconscious, and Katerina says that Ivan has already made contact with, uh, the, with Dimitri to help him escape. And if Ivan is too sick, Katerina promises that she'll help Dimitri, and Dimitri tells Alexei that they'll move to America to escape and, and be happy. Ilyusha dies. Alexei goes to the funeral. I know this is hyper condensed, so it's not totally. <laughs> Read the book. Like this isn't an actual reproduction of the Read book. Read the book. Like, Do yourself a favor. I'm kind of wrapping these up in a few sentences, so there's a lot of information being you know left out here. Um, and Ilyusha dies, and Alexei goes to the funeral, and and then you know hyper concentrated version of the epilogue. But um, if we get a thousand likes. Una will read the entire book on our YouTube <laughs> well, channel. We'll, we'll read it all. But, <laughs> but here's the thing about this, and I've probably misrepresented things throughout these whole videos, throughout these talks. I've done my best, but you know, there's, there's going to be mistakes here and there. But here's what I like about how this book ends, right? Is we're ending at a funeral, but it's almost kind of hopeful, I would say. I would say there's so much suffering and pain throughout this whole book, but I do honestly feel, I, I, I actually had kind of more of a positive, somber look as at a positive outlook even though we're in such like a crappy state and so much pain and suffering has happened, it's a really weird experience to have this juxtaposition of having a, a possible brighter future, even though everything stinks right now. Yeah, I feel like at the end here, he's trying to have this redemption of all of the characters because what he is just, you know, drug you through kicking and screaming the whole time. And I feel like he's trying to leave you with some hope. Because that's what Dostoevsky does is trying to write for future generations, you know, and, and say that there's this influence that will happen to you and, you know, for, for your children's sake and so on and so forth. And he's making you a promise that it's going to get better. Yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Communism still happens anyway. Socialism still happens anyway, Dostoevsky. 
<laughs> this is true. This is true. But for a, wh- for a while, though, the perception that things do get better, and even though we're moving outside of our timeline past his life, the idea of looking from the outside in on Russia is that everything is grand once they become communist and everything is wonderful for them when everybody is treated as equals and that class system is done away with, at least on the outside, mm-hmm. on the surface level of it. Everybody does have this wonderful, beautiful life in Russia, which obviously isn't true in the USSR, but it it does look that way. Very prophetic for Dostoevsky to have been talked to that and to talk about how I would argue that I think part of the free will conversation, not only from a religious standpoint, but can also be taken towards the the economic side of things and, and about how taking away people's free choice and, and will is going to be more harmful to the people. I, I think it's kind of interesting the way that he was speaking to that before it's even officially happened. Like communism was still this seed, this thought, this this experiment that hadn't actually been executed and he's already applying criticisms to it before it's even been tried. It's, it's really kind of interesting to me. Especially just through this one family. So I ask you as we get to the end here and kind of wrap up our final thoughts, do you feel like the story redeemed the Karamazov family, or at least the brothers? I, I don't know if you can say it does the father or not. I, I, for sure. That's way too subjective. For sure for Dimitri. Right. Like, I think he is the one that is finally the problem was that he was so sensual and that he never submitted to a master. He never submitted to, you know, the greater vision. And I think that's what he's trying to do with Grushenka because Grushenka is still mad at uh, Katerina right now. Right. And Dimitri, you said that you identify more with Dimitri anyway. This read through. Yeah. What's your point? Okay, I'm just wondering why you're picking him. I'm just saying, I'm just starting with okay. him to saying that I think, oh, I think this okay, okay, is okay. his redemption, right? I do okay. think he is turning around to realize the sensual hedonistic ways can cause harm in your society and around you. In a Dostoevsky novel, you're certainly going to be punished for it, right? And he's starting to realize that you do need to live for others, spiritual or not. I think he's starting to come around and to realize that actions can cause harm to others and that he does need to, I think, outside of his little world box. Alexei, um, obviously, he's he's probably the furthest along in his journey, and Ivan, man, he's not probably he's probably the hardest one to talk about of of seeking and finding redemption, because I think what what's happening, in my opinion, right, subjective <laughs> subjective experience here, I think he really is facing the concept of I've been wrong all along, and I think there is a God because I have seen true evil now. See me, I think that I identify more with Ivan. But I still think that Dimitri is the only one that can be redeemed because I think he's the only one that's willing to change. And the other two are too set in their ways of their their they won't question anything. They're just they're loyally blind in both of their different paths to the left and the right, you know, good versus evil. And I think that Dimitri is the only one that does have a chance to actually be redeemed at the end of this story. Maybe they all are. Maybe we're wrong. I don't know. Again, it's just kind of my opinion of how I took the end of the book. Yeah. So is this novel perfect? This is this is definitely up. There's got to be top two favorite novels for me. Um, you know, the hysterics, I know some people have problems with, like the over-exaggeration, but, you know, it's fiction for me. I don't have a problem with it. I found it quite entertaining. I, I did get a little rubbed with a lot of the anti-Semitism here in terms of how he paints the Polish individuals as the cheaters, the cheaps, the ones that cheated at the card game. The, the whole Polish chapter... There were times where I would cringe a little bit just on a personal level, particularly since, you know, one of my really good friends is Jewish. Um, and we've had lots of talks about this that, you know, there's there's writers out there that'll that'll actually do the research and tell you whether, you know, I'm not saying he was anti-Semitic, but there are other writers out there that tell you he was. To me, this just made me feel a little bit off on what otherwise would have been a perfect novel besides that one element of it. Yeah. I mean, looking back in time in a book that's over 100 years old with our 2021 rose-colored glasses, it, it's easy to pick that apart, and you are allowed to. That's the great thing about literature. When a author writes a book, you're allowed to pick it apart however you want, and you're allowed to interpret it how you want. You're allowed to enjoy and hate the certain things you want, and we're allowed to criticize as much as we want as well. Uh, I don't know if I want to put a number to this book. I just I know that over the course of all of our videos and live streams and discussions that I've made it very apparent that I think this is a must-read book, uh, that it's probably in my top three favorite single novels of all time, and that I think it is something that is uh, to be cherished and will go on to continue educating future generations. 
yeah, I don't think I want to put a number to it other other than just please go read this book if you haven't already. I think most people who have gone through a really in-depth discussion like this book have read it. And if you have, you know, I hope I hope our discussions were enjoyable, honestly. Hopefully we were able to share maybe a perspective that maybe you didn't share or maybe got you to look at something a little bit differently. And uh, I'm sure you out there have things that we missed. There's, uh, there's tons of things we know we missed. And I apologize if there's any mistakes that we made along the way meant to be a casual conversation about a book that we love and we hope you had a good time on the journey and would love for you to subscribe and, and check out other books with us as well so with that guys we post videos every monday and thursday please make sure you hit that subscribe button and join us on the adventure una out peace